Why don't you take your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 6, and if you want to get ahead of me, uh, Joshua chapter 4. And today I just have a, a message on my heart um, that is not going to come out like all of them do, because this one, for some reason, is like a work in progress. It's still working even now as I'm preparing to talk to you about what I'm going to talk to you about. Maybe you don't understand what I mean by that, but it's less a sermon and more just here's some thoughts for you today. Because even as I got up this morning, as I always do, I'm praying, God, just move and show me and give me the right words to say. And I kind of felt like the Lord was shifting my message, even though with the same structure, but giving me more to say that I need to lay aside some other thoughts and give you these thoughts so work with me today. You can't always bat a thousand, so maybe today it'll be 300 instead. So maybe that's better than most weeks, according to some of you. I don't know. But it's Memorial Day. Uh, happy Memorial Day. I, I pray that you have a good weekend. I see some family members here celebrating probably the long weekend with one another. It's good to have you here in service with us. But as we think about Memorial Day, it's a day to remember. It's a day to remember those that have fallen in service of our country, give their lives so that we could have the freedoms that we know as a country. And we can thank God for all those who have served our country that way. Veterans Day is coming when we will think about the veterans that have served our country, that have protected, that are still with us. But certainly on a day like this, we thank God for those that gave their lives. And as we do, I wanted to read this scripture, uh, Psalm 77. And Angela, you can flip the slide for me there, please. Um, Psalm 77, verse 11 and 12. Uh, as we think about remembrance, I thought this would be fitting for us to hear today in regard to remembering. It says, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember the, your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and muse on your deeds. Now, I've already kind of led us in uh, that way a little bit this morning, haven't I? Forget not the Lord and his benefits out of Psalm 103. But I love how this reminds us once again to do something that really we have to admit we don't always do. There aren't many days that we sit back at home and we have a moment because we don't often have a moment because we are Americans. And we live busy, full lives. Can somebody say amen? And uh, we're always busy. And because of that, we don't always take the time to do what the scripture says in Psalm 77, which is to remember the deeds of the Lord, remember his wonders of old, meditate on all of his works, and even muse at his deeds. Now, I get remember because I think back and remember those things. I get meditate because I just kind of sit there and uh, kind of marinate in that. But muse, I like that word muse. Isn't that fun sound? Say muse for just a moment. Muse, right? One, two, three, we can do better than that. Muse. I didn't say one, two, three yet. <laughs> muse, right? This idea of musing on the Lord, what the original language is trying to say there is to get you to relive that moment. Remember it. Meditate on it. Relive that moment. When was the last time you thought about the day you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? How you were feeling before? Why you said, I need Jesus in my life? and what you felt afterwards, and that determination you felt in your heart and where you're going with this thing. When was the last time you relived those moments? Probably been a while, hasn't it? When was the last time you mused on the miracle God has done in your life? Can anybody think of a miracle that you've experienced personally? Not that somebody else has, but you have experienced personally. Could you raise your hand? When was the last time you've mused on that? You've relived that. You really gave some thought in order to get your heart lifted up towards the Lord, encouraged a little bit more. Like Bob recalling on Facebook, it's been 25 years reliving that thought. If it hadn't been for Jesus, where would I be today? 
If it hadn't been for the miracle that he did in my life, what would be in my life today? Would I even be alive but Jesus? But now that Christ has come, man, I'm a new person. I'm a different person. I have a new trajectory in my life. I'm going a different direction than I would have been. He has done an amazing work. Muse, when was the last time we've done that? So it's appropriate that we think back, we consider, because I believe that all too often, we forget the good things God has done. We let our minds slip away from that. In fact, we get very consumed with what's happening right here, right now, don't we? We're so consumed with what's happening today or what might be happening tomorrow. And are you cooking a steak or are you cooking hamburgers? Are we playing badminton or are we going to mini golf? It's that kind of stuff. Out your amen. Hmm? We're, we're thinking the other way. We're thinking what's happening at the moment and we fail to remember. I have to admit, there's times in my life when I'm going through stuff, I don't always think back to the good things God has done. Now, most of us understand we've had some times of struggle here in the church and God's been reshaping us and remolding us and things of that nature. Can you say, yeah, we've recognized this? And there's been moments in this process that I have gotten a little bent out of shape. I have felt uncomfortable. I've not been the most happy about what's going on. But I failed to remember something. That in a church in my past that we had served in, there was times we went through some real struggle within that first year of being there. Man, there was so much dissension and lies and work of the enemy that was going on. The church, within a matter of just a, a few months, we had seen it grow to about 150 people from about 60 or 70 people. It had just taken right off, just sailing beautifully. And then all of a sudden, a couple people got their nose bent out of shape, and one of these proverbial pastor goes on vacation, and there's a special board meeting called, and we're going to vote him out of the church. And you always think those are stories that happen to somebody else. Happened to me, friends. All but one board member went. One refused to go, therefore it was not a legal meeting. And he left a message on my answering machine back in those days. So when I got home, I didn't get a voicemail while I was away. When I got home, I was greeted with the happy news. There was a special meeting called in my absence to get rid of me because the church was going downhill, almost tripled in size, but going downhill. All this stuff. And within the next, I don't know, nine months, forgive me for saying this, but all hell broke loose. And the church, within a matter of a couple weeks, went down smaller than when it was when I had originally gotten there with my family. And board members were off the board now. People had left the church. People are screaming and yelling and fighting and arguing. And they're like, well, if that's the way it's going to be there, like it's always been there, and that was a clue in my mind something was going on. I'm not going there anymore. And it came to this place that I was like, oh my goodness. I remember the district had gotten calls about me and they never called me up. So I thought, well, this is strange. Why aren't you calling me? So I called the district up. Thankfully, they had wisdom and goodness. And I said, I heard you've gotten calls about me. And they said, absolutely. And I said, well, it's funny you haven't called me. And they said, well, if we believe the things, we call them. So we don't believe these things. And so I said, well... Where do we go from here, pastor? I just gotten there, not even a year. And talking to the superintendent, he goes, Tony, he goes, we can help you just find another church. I thought, well, we can do that. But I said, then the next poor sucker that comes to be the pastor, excuse me, I just was a little plain with him. I was a little raw. The next poor guy coming in to be the pastor is going to go through the same stuff and then you're gonna be here with the same stuff. So give me this answer, are you with me or are you against me? That's how I said to the superintendent, so respectful. And he said, Tony, we're with you, it's fine. I don't believe anything they're saying is true about you. I was accused of everything but murder. I hadn't murdered anybody yet <laughs> in the flesh. 
No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. And uh, he said, we're with you. And I said, well, then we'll stay and we'll fight through it. And that was the last conversation I had with him. And then we were in the midst of months of just struggling and striving and working through what God had worked through. And God began to do something in that body, though, in the midst of it. Even though he was tearing some things apart, he was putting some things back together again. And I did something kind of crazy and loopy, but I believe I found scripture to give me evidence as to why we should do it. Because Paul said, mark out those brothers among you that bring dissension. And so every Sunday, I gave a pre-sermon fireside chat. And I said, let's turn in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6 today. But as you turn there, let me tell you, brother so-and-so has been calling some of you this week. And he's telling this lie, and I would tell them what the lie was. And I would say, here's how you need to respond to brother so-and-so the next time he calls you is say, brother, I'm happy to talk with you, but I'm not happy to hear your gossip or your slander. And I'm not going to listen to it. So we began to teach the people to close their ears to these lies, to not give any food to it, to not give any reason to it and any ear to it in such a way as to shut that down because that's not of God. The dissension began to disintegrate and the lies began to come to an end because nobody was listening anymore as good believers. Can we say amen? We're not to give ear to gossip. It's funny. Gossip is labeled right there with sins like homosexuality in the scripture. We seem to categorize these things. Homosexuality is much worse than gossip. Gossip is really, let me share a prayer request with you, Joe. Hmm? Smile. I told you. I prepared one thing, and God took me another place. And what we've got to do, and I began to coach them along this ways, and then I would get into it. And you know what? In a matter of months, God brought some of these lies and dissensions to an end because the believers wouldn't listen to it anymore. And when it was all said and done, here's my testimony. I said, God, you've got to bring an end to this. You've got to bring an end. After months and months and months, it was like gut punches all the time. Gut punch, gut punch, uppercuts. You've got to bring an end to it. And I'll never forget, it was December 31st. There was a letter that was sent to every person in the church. Not from me, but from one of my former board members that loved me without the love of Christ. He made his claim, he said what he said, he wanted this, he wanted to do that. And at that point, nobody said a word. It was December 31st. I pulled that letter out of the mail myself. I got a letter too. Well, at least he was up front that way. Nobody said a word. January 1st, we stepped to a new season in our church and before you know it, more people came back to the church than the ones that had left. And everybody came back that had left. Everybody, except two families that were the core of the problem in the first place. That was a miracle. Give the glory to God. That was a miracle. Now, understand, I'm giving you a condensed version. But that was a miracle that God did. He drew an end, he put an end date on it, which is what I was begging God for, and we never saw another issue. Like Now, granted, I had some that would try to balk against me every now and again, but what God had done in such a way is he had helped me through that struggle in such a way that he had put me in a place that the people did trust me, that people honored my leadership so that we could just continue to move forward in grace and in strength and God was glorified. And there's moments in my life as a leader of a church, I have to think back to those miracles. Because there are moments that you think back and hear again, muse, remember, meditate on how God has been good because we all too often forget that he's been good. There's been some of you, you're in maybe a health crisis right now, and you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And you know very well, God has been faithful time and time before to touch your body 
and heal your body. And he has helped you through one crisis after the other. And you know he'll be faithful to do this as well. Maybe there's some of you, you're fighting some major financial struggles in your life. And you're like, man, what am I going to do? I don't know how. And you know very well you've been at that point before. But we've forgotten. We fail to remember back. We fail to meditate on those moments and let that saturate our spirit and build our faith. We haven't mused. We haven't relived those moments. And we forget that. Why are these stones out here on the platform? Skip Deuteronomy for a second. Go to Joshua 4. The stones remind us of the book of Joshua when they crossed the Jordan River at flood stage. Do you remember that? Moses is dead. The new generation is ready to walk in. They're ready to possess the land, to take the territory God has given them. Montreal is your territory. Hmm? You're ready to take the territory God has called you to pass through and take. And here they are stepping into this thing. And what's so cool, and we'll read this here in, in Joshua chapter 4. And give me just a moment to flip over there. Allow me just to... Roll with the punches. Use your notes for looking at what it could have been to maybe now what it is. I don't know. Starting in verse 24, it says, Those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in time to come and say, What are these stones then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he had dried up before us until we crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever." Something I want to remind you about here this morning is how God is calling us to keep ourselves reminded, to keep our children reminded of the miracles of God. Let's keep our church family reminded of the miracles of God, the working of God, how he has accomplished awesome, mighty, great things among us. As we look at the stones from the middle of the river, the miracles that they remind us of, of how God has worked and what he has accomplished, what he has done. Keep us musing, keep us meditating, keep us remembering so we can continue to move forward in the grace and in the power that God has for our lives. Can somebody say amen? How many need a little more remembering today in your life? On the back of your sheet, in your bulletin, I don't often recall this, but there's some sermon notes that I already told you are probably... Not worth looking at, really. But on the back, I'm going to give you homework that I want you to begin even as I'm talking. And it says, look what the Lord has done. I want you to start even now jotting down miracles God has done in your life, how he has worked in your life as I talk for these next few moments here. And today as we think about these memorial stones, where they come into play in all of this here. This is where we catch up with Israel. This is where we catch up with their story. This is where we catch up and their story now becomes our story for just a moment today. Because again, this is something we don't need to just train our children, but we need to train ourselves to be reminded of the goodness of God, the greatness of God, his miracle working power in our lives. And as that's taking place here, he says, you know, as they cross that river Jordan, he said, go out into the middle of that river and grab yourself a stone, one of each of you from the tribe. Go grab a stone in the middle of the river. Don't go to the edge. Don't go to where your feet aren't going to get wet. Go to the middle of that river, right where you walked, where? On dry ground. Not damp ground, not mucky ground, dry ground. Miracle of God. Be reminded as you get that stone from the middle of that river, right there in the middle of that miracle, 
that you will always see that and go, I remember the day we crossed the Jordan at flood season when nobody would dare get in that river because at flood season, if you got near it, the current was so swift it could drag you right away and you'd be gone. But that day, the priests stepped their toes in the river and it was wet and swift. But as they began to step into the river, it began to part and make way for them. We saw a miracle of God. We saw God do something tremendous. We saw him transition us from where we were in the wilderness of 40 years of walking and wandering to now possessing the land. And God is wanting to remind us at moments of the miracles that we have experienced in our lives as we list these out. I couldn't help but just take a few moments and think about some of the things that God has done in our lives that I know are miracles. I've got 16 listed in just a couple minutes. I'm talking legit miracles. Every time I look at my son and every time I look at my daughter, I know they are miracles. Not because every child is a miracle of God, although they are. But come to find out as life has ensued and in the midst of the pregnancy of my wife, she should have never, ever been able to bear children or have children, ever get pregnant. If she got pregnant, there should have been issues and uh, miscarriages. There should have been uh, misshapen. They should have had some problem. And yet every time I look at my kids, I can't help but think there is a miracle of God. There is a miracle of God. Because legit, when I, I wanted to go back and find the video of when Angela had her C-section back in the day when you could literally have a camera in there. Now you can't because you can use it as evidence against your doctors. But I remember, because we couldn't record Abby's birth, but we could Alex's because he's that old. And so, which only makes me all the more old. But I remember recording it and here comes Alex out of, out of Angela, C-section. And then he looks at Angela and he goes, what in the heck is this? Those are the next words out of the doctor's mouth. Right, Angela? Because he saw so much inside that shouldn't have ever been able to carry a little baby. Full term. I never forget the Friday, I think it was a Friday before we went to do uh, an ultrasound just to make sure everything was okay. And after they looked at those things, they, they called us up immediately, said, you must get into the doctor. We found some issues. They thought there was this problem and that problem. And I'm talking up until then, other than Alex making her tremendously sick for nine months, there was no problems. And God just took care of everything. Miracles, miracles. When we think about people, you know, we waited three and a half years to have Abby and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And the doctor said, never do this again, Mrs. Searles. And then new doctor said, yes, it's going to be no problem. You can do this. This is no problem. We've dealt with people like this before. You can have another child. And then even after Abby was born, not too many complications there, but they leaned over the thing, over the little dividing sheet. Don't you love the wall? They put you behind moms. They drop a little sheet across your face and they're on that side working on you. He leans over and he says, Mrs. Searles, I don't, he didn't talk exactly, but similar to that, don't ever do this again. Another miracle. Another miracle. Because they know that this shouldn't have happened. Miracle. When I look at my wife, I see a miracle. Because in the midst of her pregnancy, she had gallstones. So she was pregnant with Alex and had a gallbladder that was out of control. And obviously, we got to deal with Alex, and you're going to have to survive the gallbladder thing until after. She goes and has her gallbladder removed some months afterwards. Here I am, full-time job. Angela's in the hospital. Here I got Alex. Go run to a babysitter. Go to the hospital. Go pick him up. Go home. Get a, all this stuff. They take her gallbladder out, and around her incision, you know what iodine looks like on your skin? It looked like that around that incision. Thought, well, it must just need to wash off. Next day, it had grown. 
well, we better call the doctor and let him know about this. Next day, it had grown even bigger. And within a week, she was brown like that from her shoulder down to her knee all around her torso. We finally get to the doctor and they say, wow, her bile duct was nicked. And so this is bile all through her body. How many know a day, a day with bile leaking in your body, you're a goner? A day. This was over a week. And then they're trying to figure out what's wrong because the doctor that did her surgery left on vacation. So he didn't write this in the notes. Every time I look at my wife, I see a miracle because she shouldn't be here right now. God is a God of miracles. When's the last time we've mused on that? These memorial stones for Israel was to be that meaningful, was to be that powerful. I can't help but get a little teary-eyed when I think about that kind of thing. I can't help but be touched emotionally because of how God worked in my family that way. At time, we weren't praying other than God keep Angela and Alex safe. We weren't praying. We didn't know what was going on. We just were there, just seeing God keep us safe. Even in the middle of that pregnancy, we moved from one church to another, got new doctors. I mean, the whole thing. God was faithful. We don't think to go back, but it, you know, Israel crossing that river should be that emotional, that deep, that life touching as well. Can you say amen? Because God had delivered them. God had moved in their lives. And I guarantee there's some of you have got miracles you could talk about here today. And let me just, for the sake of time, and just because I feel like I have to at least feel like I preach somewhat, I feel like I'm just giving you a testimony. But this is what we need to be mindful of. Those stones were left there in Gilgal for Israel to remember how God had brought them through. And some of you have left your miracles back in 1996 where mine were with Alex and Angela. Some of you left your miracles back in 2002. And God said, no, you need to bring these miracles with you where you're going so you don't forget this stuff. You need to carry it into your present right here, right now. You need to remember these things. He didn't say build that altar back at the river. Then if you happen to leave the territory I give you and go back and go to the river, no, he said bring it into a place where you are so you never forget how God has worked in your life. It's gonna be right there. You're gonna be stepping into it. You're gonna be stepping around it, but you're reminded of it. And then you need to pause and muse for a minute. I remember zig and zagging back and forth between the hospital and home and church. I remember the doctor going in and putting a stent in Angela to fix this thing. And you muse about these things and relive that moment to be mindful of here she is today, here he is today, here she is today. And here we are today. So the next time something comes your way, you say, I remember God did this thing in my life. I remember God did this miracle in my life. You know what, I'm gonna maybe take it a little different direction right now. Read the notes, see how awesome that sermon would have been. <laughs> but I want to start us off for just a second. Is this okay? Today has already been a weird day. I apologize, it's weird. You'll at least get an offering, so it'll make it memorable for you. I just want to muse with you for a minute. And then I want you to muse with us for a minute. Have you been filling out your list on this Memorial Day weekend? 
of the miracles that God has done in your life and how he's worked because we too often forget how he's worked in our life. We too often forget how he's been happening, making things happen. You know, on the one side, I say there, point number one, for those who gave their lives and talking a little bit about the Israelites and these priests stepping in to the River Jordan. They stepped in while it was still flood season. They would have gave their lives if that need be to take that step of faith. We so often are preserving our lives. We're so often so careful, so cautious, and then we wonder, why are there no miracles in my life? Why don't I see God working? Why don't I see God doing what He can do? I read about it in the Bible. Yeah, but you also read about people taking those steps of faith into the floodwaters of the Jordan, and they see God move because they dared move first. What's wrong with the church today? Not just wag, I'm talking about the body of Christ. We don't dare to take those steps of faith anymore like we used to. Then we don't see the Jordans part and we walk through on dry ground because we don't dare do what they dared to do. I know some of the stuff I'm talking about, we brought it on ourselves to some degree, but yet God was faithful. But you want to see God do miracles in your life? Be willing to put yourself out there and let God do something in the middle of it. Isn't it Galatians, I think, that says this, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. No longer I that live. And we're cautious for ourselves. I'm dead. I'm a dead person walking with Christ in me. It's no longer I that live, it's Christ. So I'm trying to protect who? This guy that's already surrendered his life. That old man's still trying to get up though, isn't he? Protect himself and keep himself and sustain himself. And that's why we don't get into the river. And that's why we don't see any miracles. You've got to be willing to step in a little bit. You think about these things, the great miracles that they saw. Why were those stones taken out of the middle there? To remind them of the great miracles that they saw take place. To remind them again, we crossed the River Jordan, nothing. The AI in front of us and Jericho is nothing to be compared to that. Huh? You think about what Christ has done in your life. I mentioned earlier, a soul that gets saved is the greatest miracle you're ever going to see. I pray you see so many souls in Canada get saved up in Montreal, and that will be the greatest miracle you'll ever see up there. We see God do miracles here every week. We see, I try to never end a service without saying, is there anybody that would like to receive Christ? And there's weeks we'll see zero answer, but there's been weeks that we've seen 12 answer. And we're kind of like the guys around Jesus when the man was lowered down through the roof. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. And they go, yeah, that's easy for you to say. Show us something real. It's easy to say your sins are forgiven. There's, where's the evidence there? And Well, who are you? Or you think your God can do this? You know all that stuff too. But he says, so I can show you that I can forgive sins Rise up from your mat and walk. You see, we're the ones that want to see people jump up out of their mats and walk away or their wheelchairs, which I want to see happen. Believe me. But are we leaving the service just as excited that 10 people gave their hearts to Jesus as if somebody got up out of their wheelchair and walked out? Both are miracles. Both should send us to the moon. Keep us remembering. Keep us reminded. Keep us musing. Man. God has worked, thinking about how he has worked in your life. We do some memorials here in church every time a month goes by. We have communion. Isn't that a memorial to remind us of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, how he came and he died and he gave his life for us? Psalm 103 says, forget not the benefits of the Lord. And I ended around 11 or 12 where it says he takes your sins from you as far as the east is from the West. When's the last time we've sat and mused about that? 
Isn't it awesome that Jesus forgave us of our sins and I'm a new person. I'm not the same old guy I would have been and you're not the same old guy or girl you would have been without Christ. You're a new creation, a brand new person in Jesus Christ. And now you have a new destiny, a new life because of Jesus. In fact, you have life abundant because of him. Isn't that awesome? To think, why are those stones there? Because of the miracles that you have seen getting across the Jordan safely. And on the other side, what are the miracles you have seen? People that are not going to take Honestly, maybe six people that could come and muse for a moment about the miracle of God. Can we do that on Memorial Day weekend? Just line up. And I'm not bragging. I just reminded myself here. I think back at what the Lord had done. You can come up while I'm talking, by the way. When I was a teenager, I flipped a four-wheeler on top of me. Not just roll over. I was going up the hill and I had gunned it by accident. That thing popped up because it was cool and fast. Come right up, please. And that thing came slamming down on top of me. Just in the right place. It could have crushed my head. I remember laying in bed for days because I didn't want to move. I think, man, God saved my life. A redneck kid running around on a four-wheeler up in Caribou, Maine. Happened right in my backyard. Remember one time in the beautiful roads of northern Maine. It was winter. I was driving my 79 Ford Mustang. And I was downshifting around a curve, and the tires hit just long enough to send that thing spinning around and around. As I was coming around a big turn... And it wound up almost going right into a ditch face first. And no cars were coming the other direction. I'm thinking I could have been slammed right there, T-boned. And what a miracle. I remember walking into my home as a kid on Christmas Eve. And we were heating our house with a wood stove. Some people still do that, like Roy and Judy, right? And, and you guys are cedars. How many still use wood? Our wood stove had popped open while we were at my grandmother's for Christmas Eve. And coals spilled out onto the floor. We walked in the house. The house is full of smoke. Right on Sweden Street. You know where I lived, Beth, right? Our house didn't burn down that night, thank God. I just think what a miracle that was. I, I had septic, I went septic one time. i never forget, I don't know how it happened, why it happened, what happened. But I, my feet got infected with something. My feet were turning black as Bob's shirt. And hurt like they were in a vice. And I went for weeks like that, trying to, I can fix this, uh, so whatever. I had no clue what it was. I preach on Sunday morning, and then like what many times we do here, I wind up talking to folks afterwards. And all I could think, forgive me, God, please get me out of here because my feet are killing me. I mean, it literally felt like they were in a vice just being crunched. Finally gave in and went to the doctor. How many men know what I'm talking about? And the doctor said, I should put you in the hospital because you were that sick. I, I remember Abby and I were driving to Pittsfield, and she was just a little tiny girl. I was driving her up. This is before I went to the doctor, and I was starting to get lightheaded and dizzy, felt real feverish, and I'm like on the New York State Thruway, and I'm like, God, please at least let me get to Pittsfield, Mass. So my daughter's not left alone with me dead here because I felt that horrible. Just get me there so that she's safe. And if you're going to take me with my stupidity and not going to a doctor, then do it after, please. And I was septic. I mean, they barely saved my life, really. Barely saved my life. So God saved our lives to come here to preach to you, just so you know that. Anyhow. Thank you. I didn't say it for that, but thank you. 
I could go on and on. I could think of a time we needed a financial miracle in our lives. I mean, serious financial miracle. Never forget, we prayed and fasted for a few days. And I won't tell you the whole turn of events, but God provided for us. I'm talking large sums of money. Now, I had gotten in no trouble with a bookie or anything like that. <laughs> but we needed a miracle. And God was faithful and provided miraculously. I've taken forever to muse. So you guys are 20, 30 seconds, okay? Right? I'll try. Go ahead. I'll try. Well, I'm glad you shared all of that with us. Uh, yeah, I've got lots of stuff too, but I will just focus on one thing. Uh, when I met my, my husband, um, I was, we, um, we dated for maybe two months or so, and we found out that he had a big tumor in his right leg, like the size of a football. He thought it was a, a, a muscle that had not, anyway, it was cancer, and so we went through this whole thing, the, uh, therapy and and, and uh, surgery and all of that. We had to go to Boston all the time. And uh, so he had several surgeries and uh, well, all of that. And um, um, anyway, um, and then his uh, insurance company said that they were bankrupt. We had all these bills to pay, you know, and uh, it was piling up. But um, he had more surgery and, and Anyway, we get married in the middle of it, and he, um, after three years of being married, he found out that he uh, had, that the cancer had gotten into his brain. And so he had surgery for that, and we were in the hospital, and the, one of the doctors had gotten to know him really well, and, and uh, we knew that he was dying. And he said to me one time, he said, you know, I want you to come with me. I don't want you to worry about all the bills that I've been piling up. Uh, come with me to the office. And I went with him. And Bruce was upstairs in bed. And, and uh, the bottom line was that he said, you know, we've got alumni people um, paying every month. You know, so much money. There's so much money for certain people. And uh, they paid for all of his, his bill. And it was like thousands of dollars. You know, that was just one. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Watch out for the miracle. Go right ahead, Ellen. I'm going to move this stone here. Go ahead. Wow, oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, please. I just wanted to say to the Lord that I muse about the way that you seem to carry me every moment lately because um, I seem to struggle with um, loneliness and depression and, and as you probably know the kids my family has always meant a lot to me in the Lord and um, my kids, unfortunately, witnessed um, their parents um, fighting a lot and me suffering at the hands of a not-so-very-loving, kind husband. And so that made it so that they figured they didn't need to respect and love their mom. And so once again, last evening, when I thought I was going to have a nice little barbecue with my oldest kids and my grandchildren. They proceeded to back talk and put me down, make me feel worthless again so that I had to leave because I refused to be put down and not respected. I said, I can go home, which I did. And I would rather have taken my Mustang and maybe drove it into a telephone pole or something, you know. And I say, no, that's not what God wants me to do. He wants me to be strong. When I figure I'm the one that's trying to be strong and be a Christian woman, even though my kids still 
At least I got a call from my daughter apologizing for her ways this morning, but it gets old after a while, you know. You wonder how old you have to get before you can get that respect. But anyway, I just want to say thank you, Lord, for that strength to just keep me going. Sorry, I took a little bit longer than 30 seconds. Lord, we just pray in life and health and peace in Jesus' name. God, that you would heal up what needs to be healed up and make her a mighty woman of God. Lord, that trust in you deeply. And God, these thoughts no longer come. We rebuke them in Jesus' name. Life and life abundantly in Jesus' name. Well, many of, the, of you know um, what I have testified over the past three years about the cancer. Um, I haven't heard the words cancer-free, but one of the things that blessed me right from the beginning was that I heard the voice of God who said, count it all joy. And he just filled me with joy, and it hasn't left. The devil tried twice to take it from me, but I recognized him, and um, I, am, I am full of joy, and whatever happens, you know, the cancer belongs to him, and he can do with it and use it however he wants. Praise his name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Um, a few years ago, I was in a serious automobile accident. I was extremely tired and I dozed off for a second and opened up my eyes and I was headed for a telephone pole, which I did hit, and I just cried out, Lord Jesus, help me. And um, I don't remember hitting the pole, but my car flipped, turned upside down. It was a total, um, and I came away from that with a fractured little pinky. And then I did not know how I was going, you know, I says, well, Lord, you know, my car is totaled. I'm just waiting for you to give me a new one. And within a month's time, I got a telephone call saying, do you want this car, my Toyota Prius? I got that Toyota Prius absolutely for nothing, and it has done me good. And so he spared me from an accident, and he gave me a, brand new, and gave me a new car. Hallelujah, praise his name. Well, I'll have to narrow it down to, to three. There's so many mir miracles, but um, the greatest is my salvation. Um, saving me from a wretched life. <laughs> and now having a wonderful life. And then I'm constantly reminded of two very big miracles, um, Peter and Anita. Um, we... As most of you know, we, we traveled overseas to adopt them. And we were told when we picked them up that um, they told us Anita would uh, probably dance at her wedding, but she would never play soccer. But she played soccer right out there and basketball here. And I believe I'm going to see her dance at her wedding. <laughs> and um, they told us that Peter would probably never walk, but he ran cross country when he was going to school at Jordan Small. And now he's going to Bible school. So, Amen. Praise, praise God. Praise God. <laughs> well, I, I have a lot, but I, really quick. Short time. Uh, two seconds, I can do if this. If we're over today, it's not <laughs> my, my fault. fault anyway. <laughs> Keep it short. Yep. So, I'm just going to go with the list. That abuse from childhood by a my uh, best friend's father, I've been freed. Abuse from an abusive marriage, I've been freed. Uh, commitment from mental hospital, two times I was freed. I have a home for my children. I have jobs every time I was provided a job. And now I have a pension. And I was blessed with an education, a master's degree. Um, and I've always had protection from my family, my mom, my dad, my boys, my grandchildren. And that's my list. Amen. You can pass it right down. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had 12 items on my list before Pastor Tony invited us in. Here's one uh, that isn't on the list. 
my little toddler fell up against the wood-burning stove in our home. It was scorchingly hot. He lost his footing. He fell against it. His little tiny handprint was burnt into the stove. It is there to this day. It could not be scrubbed off. It was burnt so severely. The immediate thought was, <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus, as it always had been. And we prayed, and Matthew's hand was totally healed, and he never had any pain. He stopped crying. There were broken bones that were instantly healed. There were telephone poles when we were heading into a head-on collision that all of a sudden the pole was behind us. We were transported in time. God's miracles have been a part of my life. I am looking for them, and I see them because I expect him to be there. He is my strength. The, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And, that, and I always add, the strength of the Lord is my joy. He got me through cancer when I was so frightened. He led me through all of the treatments that scared me and all the words that I heard. And I've overdone my time. Sorry. So I'm not going to share a story, but I do want to share a word as I think about Pastor Tony talking about remembering and remembering these things that God has done. I think one of the things sometimes Satan wants to do is convince us that it was a coincidence and sometimes even convince us that maybe it didn't really happen, not practically, but maybe it didn't happen the way you're remembering. Maybe you're remembering it wrong. And I just want to condemn that thought today because it's not true. And if you're trying, if you're thinking of these things and you're thinking like sometimes I do, maybe that was a coincidence or maybe, maybe it didn't happen the way I'm remembering it. That's, you know, that's just, that's not true. Um, it is true. And God really did work um, mightily. So just don't, don't be fooled by that lie because it is a lie and God, God's just amazing. So I'll make this quick. Uh, sometimes we think of the big miracles, or the healings and the health. This is a little seemingly unimportant thing. Uh, I was uh, saved in Gainesville, Florida. And, but I used to go to Florida, University of Florida basketball games. And I'd go outside and I'd put up my hand and people would walk by and they'd give me tickets. Free. And I'd get good seats. Well, one day the biggest game of the year is the Kentucky-Florida game. You can't get tickets for this. So I'm out front and I'm putting up my hand and I saw this man and he was crippled and he had his hand up and I said, Lord, I know you got a ticket for me, but give this man. Give him my ticket. So somebody came up and they gave him a ticket. Then he walked up to the gate and he handed me the ticket. But that's not, that's a miracle, but it's not the biggest miracle. I turned around, there's a turnstile, and I turned around to thank him. He wasn't there. So honest to God, he was gone. It had to be an angel. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. Good to see you. Amen. Wasn't that fun? Yeah. You're looped in, Rob. I keep hearing the word restoration in my head. Um, we've been together 22, <laughs> four, something like that. And we were never able to become husband and wife while we lived in Alabama. And um, just in the last, gosh, couple of months, uh, we met with um, Pastor Tony and Angela and just talked to them and told them, you know, we felt like we were kind of lost because we've always been in ministry. And God has got us sitting low and quiet. He says, you know, just be still and know that I'm God. 
Well, the restoration has been coming for our marriage because we're able to be husband and wife in a place we never thought we would be. And I just need you guys to know, especially those that doubt themselves, that are in depression, that are hurting, that have struggles each and every day. I suffer from depression for years. Even since we got here, we both kind of dealt with it. But the thing about it is, um, this won't take me just a minute. I had this in my devotional the other day. And if you don't think God can restore something that's broken, he can. You just have to step out of the way because we love each other more now than we ever have. And that's just in the last couple of months. It says, approach each new day with desire to find me. Before you get out of bed, I have already been working to prepare the path that will get you through this day. There are hidden treasures strategically placed along the way. Some of the treasures are trials designed to shake you from the earthly shackles. Others are blessings that reveal my presence, sunshine, flowers, birds, friendship, answered prayers. I have not abandoned this sinful, wreckful world. I am still richly present in it. Search for deep treasures as you go through this day. You will find me all along the way. I just want to encourage you guys. You don't know us very very well because we kind of keep low and keep quiet. But the struggles and the trials that we have been through go in so many directions. Drugs, alcohol for me, suicide, um, you know, uh, uh, pornography, everything. And the enemy will come in like you will not believe. And he will come when you least expect it. And he will creep in and he will find you at your weakest place. And he will get you to give in to that temptation because he finds where he, you're vulnerable. So be aware of your surroundings, but also ask God to shield you from those that cannot harm you. And ask God to go through each day with you. Ask him to be with you. When you get up the next morning, thank him for that day because you were able to get out of bed. You were able to breathe in your lungs. You know, there's someone that will go to bed or go, to, you know, come out of these doors today or somewhere that won't get the chance that we have. And we have a chance every day to praise the God. And we have a chance to thank Him. We have that freedom. And you know, those, the military fights for our freedom every day. And I just want to encourage those that feel like they're broken and they have no place to go and they're not loved, they're not wanted, and they're not needed. You're number one lover is God. Go to Him with all your hurts, all your pains, because when you suffer the most, He'll pick you up off the ground. He will carry you. When it says those footprints are in the sand and there was only two, it's because He's carrying you through those times. I just want to encourage you guys. I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, the funny thing about what she just shared with you, I sat over there That's what God wanted me to share with you today. I'm crying. (laughs) Because I see marriages dissolve without fight. And it hurts me because I'm standing next to my best friend now. (laughs) See, 10 years ago, the miracle started when I got saved. And then at my baptism, she got saved. And then the miracle of the restoration of our marriage is something that is so important to me. And I know 20 or 30 seconds is the time frame, but I sat in my seat, and I'm inside of my heart 
e cansado. I love Jesus with all my heart, but I fight every day just like you do. I've never been in a place that needs Jesus any more than the three states that we have surrounding us. We moved from Alabama, and this has been one of the hardest things, but the most gratifying thing that I've ever done in my life. To call this woman my best friend is something that she's been waiting for for a long time. So those of you that are here, if you have your husband's not here right now, I tell you it's going to be okay. You keep praying and fighting. Because one day you're going to see that miracle happen. Because we are a living testimony. Every day we, we look at each other now and it's an, it's an interesting thing because it's something I've never had. We usually would get up and fight, argue. I'd get angry because she'd spend all our money. She'd get angry with me because I'd sit there with a scowl on my face and watch war movies or the Red Sox. That's the thing. You know, when we look at each other, we, we came together and we were not. I'm an athlete. Uh, you know, you can't tell, but I'm an athlete, a sports freak. She's a spender. She likes to shop. But now when I look into her, into her eyes, I realize she looks at, don't go shopping with her because you'll be there all day. That's why I don't go anymore. And she accepts that, lets me stay at home and watch Alabama. But that's the thing. There's so much to life, but there's so much to the one that you call your spouse. It took us a long time. It didn't happen overnight. It's been a long time. It actually started when I lost my dog of all things and then I snapped in half and then she snapped in half and all of a sudden things were different. And let me tell you, when it starts to get different, start watching out because that's when God is starting to change things in your life. And I promise you that all the prayers and everything that you've held on to and you've kept asking God and you do it every single day, one day it's going to come to an end. Everything. There's not one thing that God doesn't listen to. The thing is, you have to understand that He is working things around you and you have to be patient because He trusts you with that patience. Don't pray for patience because it'll hurt you. I've done it. But when I look into her eyes now and I see her grab my hand and I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. She never saw me cry for the first 20 years of us being together, and now I'm a blubbering idiot. You know why? Because Jesus took the thing inside of me. When I got saved, it became a hard rock, but then all of a sudden God ripped it out. And I felt that. They told me then, too, that's what's interesting. They told me that I was going to be empty inside. And I was like, how was that? But I was, because now all the bad was out, and God starts to fill Amen. it in. It was God. good. Praise God. So let him. Amen. Praise God. Let him do it. Amen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, great, great stuff, guys. Can we praise the Lord. Come on. Let's stand up. I want to read this last little verse to you. I started with it, Psalm 77. It said, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy work wonders of old. I will meditate on thy work and muse on thy deeds. It continues, thy way, O Lord, is holy. What God is great like our God? What we just heard, who else is doing this stuff? It's not the, the God that the Laos people were bowing to in the video we watched. There's no God like our God. Thou art the God who works wonders. Thou has made known thy strength among the people. Thou hast by thy power redeem thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. What, what do you leave here today? I know if you're a visitor, forgive us, we never go this long, but today just a moment, I think is a holy moment. We need to be mindful of what God has done 
We need to never forget how he's worked in our life, what he's doing in our lives. We need to be amazed by him again. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, how many of you need today to walk out of this place with that list <clears throat> at the forefront of your mind to help you through whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, that you can be amazed by God again. Maybe you've got to go home and make that list, but maybe you've forgotten and you need to get refocused. Would you raise your hand today? Because you've got to make it through some stuff that God's going to bring you through because he's been good. I see a bunch of hands going up. God, we're just raising our hand today saying, God, thank you for the reminder that we need to remind ourselves of how faithful you've been, how good you've been, how generous you've been, how good you've been when we didn't even know what you've saved us from. We don't know the accidents we've been saved from. We don't know the sicknesses that you've healed us from, that we are well from, and we don't even know we're ever there. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that today would be a turning point for these people as we look at these memorial stones along the way. And God, we remember them today. God, I pray that it would encourage us to know that you're a great God, bigger than anybody else. And God, that we would dare to take steps of faith again. And we would dare to walk this walk of faith like we haven't walked before. I pray, God, today that something new would come upon us. And this would be a new day of new direction for your people, God. And Father, that you would bring us forward in the name of Christ, that we would not get caught up with the old ways and the old things, but God, we would be able to say, behold, I do a new thing among you, but I've done old things that you need to remind yourself of so that you can know I will continue in the future to do these things. And God, I pray that you would fill our minds, fill our hearts with continued miracles and that you would get the glory that you would get the praise. Now, I want us to praise him like we haven't praised him for a long time. Can we do that for a moment? Can we just thank him and rejoice for a moment this morning? God, you're worthy to be praised and glorified. You're worthy to be adored in this house today, God. You're worthy to be worshiped. Come on, don't just patty cake him. Let's thank him today for his goodness, his miracles that he's done, that he'll continue to do in your life. We thank you, God. Lord, if we'd rejoice in front of a sports game, let us rejoice in you today, God. We rejoice in you today, God. Amen.